how hard it is to contain or to control water. I don't know about you, but we work hard at trying to keep water out of this building. <laughs> I mean, just ask David and Christopher and Gino about this. They were busy yesterday attending to a, a faulty drain on the, on the side of the building. I mean, we're always dealing with water getting in where it's not supposed to go. And it, it seems no matter we, where we turn, th there's another leak. There was a leak in the office upstairs. There's a leak in the coffee sh lounge. Everywhere. And if you don't believe me, I can give you a little tour afterwards to show you all the little spots where we've had challenges. And, and, uh, and as I was thinking about it, it's all, it, it kind of all flowed, pardon the pun, out of the passage of Scripture that you just heard read in John 7. I mean, I don't know about you, but I really love the imagery that Jesus lifts up in that passage. This using water to speaking, speak about the outpouring of the Spirit. I'd remind you that in Palestine, the place where Jesus uttered these words, water was precious. I remember living in the, the deserts of Southern California where the only thing that grew in our garden were the things that we watered. That's it. I'm serious. Nothing grew if you didn't water it. Everything else perished under the hot sun. It was apparent, really apparent, as you walked into our garden where the water had been placed, that water was life, life-giving. In our context, of course, water is kind of everywhere, isn't it? I was reminded of this during my, my recent pilgrimage to Ireland, where I visited a, a place called Glendalough. Glendalough is a, is a, a, a place... Uh, in the Wicklow Mountains, in a valley, a valley between two lakes, it's called. That's what it means, Glendalough. We visited that place because back in the 5th, 6th, through the 12th, 13th century, there was a monastic community that thrived in that place. And it's a beautiful place. It's absolutely gorgeous. You can see why they, they set up camp there. And as I walked those ancient paths, I noticed something. I noticed water everywhere. There were, of course, the lakes. There were the ever-present rivers that surrounded those lakes. There was the, the wonderful Palouse Falls. But there was more. It, it, there was this well <laughs> that was less than 100 meters from a river. I mean, what's that about? And as you walked the pass, you could hear the gurgling brooks that were just in, the, in, the, in beside the, the, the paths, the walking paths that were there. As I sat down to reflect and to think, you could see in the rock face water leaking out of the rock, flowing, moving. And I was reminded as I was in that place that it, it reminded me of God's Holy Spirit, how he is everywhere, moving and active and flowing, that there is no place that he's not. Now, if I'm honest, I much prefer a sunny day over a rainy day any day of the week. But as I read this passage, I found myself wondering if I might find a new love of rain. I got to think about how, as I walk in the rain, at trying to keep dry, right? I discovered that water always seems to find a way in. It reminds me of another trip that I took to Glendalough. It was, it was near Easter, and we had gone up there to do a walk. And as we arrived in that place, it was chucking it down. The rain was just, I mean, it, it was like they were just pouring buckets on us. I mean, it was just awful. Four of us had come together, and as we stood with this group of other people, the leaders of the walk said that they were having to cancel it because some of the places that we were intended to walk were no longer paths but rivers. <laughs> so we walked our slowly back to the car and decided, you know, we're already out here. We've got our rain gear on. It's just a little water. Let's just go for a little walk ourselves. And so the four of us began a walk, and I took out my phone, and I put it in my pocket and zipped it up on one of my rain jackets so, so I could keep it dry. We walked for an hour or so, and then we came back to the car. And as I arrived back at the car, I undid that pocket and pulled out my phone, and lo and behold, guess what? The water had found a way in. My phone didn't work anymore. 
And I, I thought about that in relationship to what we're talking about this morning. And I, I think it's a wonderful picture of how the Spirit longs to find a way into each of our lives. Because the Spirit, like living water, looks for a way in that He might do His work in us. Remember, the Spirit is the answer to a promise. The promise of a helper, an advocate, a comforter. This morning, I, I want to read another passage of Scripture that is perhaps the quintessential text of Pentecost. And as I do, I want you to listen for a moment for the coming of the Spirit, even into an upper room that's separated from the rest of the world. So hear God's word. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard his own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who speak in Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, A Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jew and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all, you, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Now, you probably noticed that there is no reference to water in those words that I've just read. Instead, we have this reference to fire and wind. But I don't know about you, I can't help but think how similar these, similar these metaphors are. Fire, wind, water. Each of these elements, in some respects, is uncontrollable. You'd struggle to contain them, as you can't hold water in your hands without it dripping out on falling on the floor. You certainly can't hold wind in your hand. You can't hold fire in your hand. And it's all, to me, a wonderful reminder to us, to the church, that we are not in control. The Holy Spirit does not need to be managed. He is the third person of the Trinity, and he goes where he wants. <laughs> and amazingly, what we discover is that he longs to come into our midst. He longs to come into us, into the midst of God's people. Of course, this day is special to us because on it we remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church, don't we? And much like I, how I poured out that jug of water, his Spirit is outpoured on us. And when I speak of us, I'm not talking about a place. I'm speaking about a people. The outpouring on a people. And it's really the defining moment for the church. But maybe not for the reasons that we, we often think. I mean, we have a tendency, I don't know about you, but you read a passage like this and we kind of focus on the gifts, right? The wonder of this moment. I mean, let's face it, it must have been incredible, right? To, to see the fire fall, 
to hear the rushing of that mighty wind through that place. It must have been awesome to hear all those different languages, people who weren't supposed to be able to speak them, speaking them. But I think there's something we need to keep in mind, that first and foremost, Pentecost is about his presence. It was not those miracles that would define them as a people. It was the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit in their midst, in their lives. You see, we we cannot afford to forget that our identity as the people of God is found in his presence in us and with us. I was reminded of this as I was reading this week in the the book of Exodus. You remember the story in Exodus chapter 3 where where God comes to Moses and they have this conversation and God says in essence, you know, my presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. And Moses is like, well, you better go with us because if you don't go with us, how will anyone know that we're your people? And he was right. Moses got it. He understood that it was the presence of God that defined them as his people, not anything else. So I guess the question is, well, what difference does his presence make? What difference should his presence make in us? What what should a church look like that is filled with the Spirit? How, How does that alter and change us as a people? Well, one of the things that, that I saw immediately as I was looking at this was, was this idea of movement. The living water of which Jesus spoke in John, the imaginary tongues of fire and the rushing wind in Acts suggests not a static presence, but a presence that is on the move, right? The Holy Spirit doesn't come to fill a place alone. Maybe you remember when I first started pouring this water in this class, it was all, yeah, it made sense, yeah, I'm getting a drink of water for myself. It was contained, it was in the glass. We kind of like that, don't we? We like to have some semblance of control. But the the truth is the Holy Spirit doesn't simply come to fill this place, this life, or even just a certain place in a life. He comes to fill every part He comes to be poured out everywhere on all of us and every part of us. The 120 in that upper room find the Holy Spirit coming on them and the next thing we know, they're they're moving, right? The the upper room can't contain them. It, It can't contain the Spirit of God. In fact, if you think about it, the story of Acts is really the unfolding story of that outpouring. As the Spirit moves across all sorts of barriers, He meets them where they are. Well, you heard the, the, the list of, of nations and the people that were shared with. And if that's not enough, we later see, we, we later hear Peter, uh, I mean Paul, moving into pagan and Gentile territory, working with women as well as men. Like Peter had prophesied, he will pour out his flesh on men and women, on sons and daughters. You see, the good news is that the, is that the gospel is for all of humanity. It's not for me alone. It's not for us alone. And the truth is, for us to try and hold it to ourselves will result in death. I mean, think about the Dead Sea. Why is it the Dead Sea? Because, well, no water flows out of it. He is poured out on us, not just for us. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, while he cannot be restrained, he cannot be controlled or contained, much like water, like fire, like wind, he is on the move. And because he's active, because he comes on all flesh, that we might know and experience the love of God in Christ. And we see this in Luke's telling of Pentecost, don't we? The disciples who had been hiding for fear of the Jews in an upper room, like a mighty waterfall cascading down over rocks, they they spill out into the city. And they begin to fearlessly proclaim Christ because the church is on the move. I would suggest that the church is at its best when prompted by the Spirit we move out of our comfort zones. Really. Of course, you see, the, the, the issue with that, it takes a little courage to do that, doesn't it? And we see that in Acts. In the words 
uh, beyond our reading in Acts 2, we, 2, we hear Peter proclaiming to the crowd, he says to the crowd, you, with the help of wicked men, put Jesus to death. And I'm going, what happened to Peter? I mean, just a few days ago, he'd been wilting in front of a maiden who'd asked him if he even knew Jesus, and now he's saying, you, with the help of some other bad people, put Jesus to death. That's courage. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin, having been teaching in the temple. You know, the Sanhedrin was the body that had presented Jesus to Pilate. They were a powerful body. And they ask, they ask, they ask Peter a question. And in response to the question from this powerful body, Peter says in Acts chapter 4, verse 9, he says this, he says, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness showed to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, he could have just stopped there, but no, Peter's not going to stop because what does he go? He goes on, he says, whom you crucified, but who God raised from the dead, this man now stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. I mean, how, how did, did Tim and Peter become so courageous? Well, I can tell you because it says right there in chapter 4, verse 8, the verse right before this response of Peter. Do you know what it says? It says, it says then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders. Peter was filled with the Spirit, was enabled, was emboldened to move, move out of his comfort zone and to reign on their parade, you might say, to, to take out, to, to, I mean, talk about the wind of the Spirit, talk about fire falling, right? There's one final thing that, that I want to note, because Peter simply isn't, isn't simply encouraged. He isn't simply emboldened to move out, move out of his comfort zone. He is equipped to do so. I mean, they all are. Peter, this unschooled, ordinary man, to use the language of Acts 4, speaks prophetically. This fisherman is gifted to proclaim the good news of Jesus to this crowd. In Acts 2, Peter quotes from the prophet Joel. And if that's not enough, it appears that 120 of these people in the upper room are enabled to speak in languages, the languages of all these visitors who have come to the city for the festival. I, I was thinking about the reading that we had just before we received our new members, the reading from 1 Corinthians, where Paul speaks of our gifting by the Spirit. But as he speaks, he makes this declaration. He says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. You see, this gifting is not for us alone. You know the, the book, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, part of the, the Chronicles of Narnia series? One of the characters, you'll remember Lucy, she's given this gift by Father Christmas. It's this, it's this small little bottle of powerful medicinal potion that's in it, that can heal wounds, that can that can cure illnesses, that can rescue people from the brink of death. What a gift Lucy's given. But it's not for her. She is the one who is entrusted to carry this gift, to administrate it to others. And the truth is, we have been gifted by the Spirit, entrusted with a gift for the benefit of others. He comes to us not simply to make our lives better, giving us gifts that we can hold for ourselves. He comes and gifts us so that we might be a gift to our world, to one another. You see, these gifts are really not the point, at least for Paul. I mean, if you go back and read that, that 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians again, you'll, you'll see what he, that he's suggesting that our variety in gifting flows from what? The same spirit. And that, word, that, that phrase, the same spirit, is used again and again, over and over, repeated over and over again in this passage. Paul is wanting us, wanting to be clear in this, that it is the spirit that makes the difference, not the gift. Amen. And he is what we should long for. 
Now, let's go back to that story in Acts chapter 2. We read that these 120, they were spilled out under the streets of Jerusalem that were enabled to speak in the language, these other languages. Why? Because this outpouring on these disciples was not for them alone. It was for the world. We speak of this day, and, and rightly so, as, as we saw a little cake with candles and we sang happy birthday, we see this as the birthday of the church. And it's easy to think, well, then, if it's the birthday of the church, then all the gifts are for us, right? This is my, these are my gifts. After all, it's our birthday. But this day is all about God's Spirit coming upon his church, filling her, and then pouring her out for the world with courage and the gifts to be poured out for the other. I, I think of the, the scripture that I read at the very outset of our service this morning from Psalm 67. Did you hear these words? May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. Why? He goes on and he says, so that his ways may be known on earth his salvation among the nations. You see, the blessings that we receive are not for us alone. They are for the world. I remember a walk that uh, Lee invited us to join him on. It's probably, I don't know, probably a year ago. We met at Andrew and Jay's house. I don't know if you remember, it was raining. <laughs> I mean, just really raining. Uh, I'm sure those of who went will never forget because of the rain. And it's probably made us a little suspect of Lee if he asks us to go on a walk again because we're not sure if it's... Now, he's not here to defend himself, but that's okay. Um, I'm sure he'll get his word in. But, you know, by the time I got home from that walk, I was soaked to the bone. Absolutely soaked. And so was Penny, our dog. I, I'd worn all the rain gear that I knew or that I had. But it didn't matter because that water found its way in. Now, there was a point in that walk when I realized it's futile to try and, and keep this, to keep dry. I guess I just surrendered. I just recognized that I was going to get wet. And I think, oh, that we might surrender to the Holy Spirit, that we might allow him to so fill us that we would be moved in a different direction, that we would be encouraged, that we would be equipped to love, to serve. You know, I look around this place this morning and I think about the incredible variety. We have people from every continent. We have men and women, boys and girls, young and old, rich and poor, And you know what? The Spirit of God has come to be poured out on all of us. The day of the Lord is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. And the truth is, whatever language is your mother tongue, whatever, whatever food is your favorite, whatever clothes are your, you feel most comfortable in, whatever climate is, is the most familiar, whatever language you have, your language is spoken in the kingdom. And this new reality is your home because we are his church, his people, his presence in a broken world. I wonder if we might surrender to the outpouring of the spirit in our lives that we would open our lives to his spirit, allowing him to find his way into every little nook and cranny of our lives, every corner of our lives, of our church. My prayer is that his spirit would be outpoured on us, moving us, equipping us, encouraging us. I really believe that God is at work in our world. I believe that he is here moving in our midst. I know that he is uncontainable. He is uncontrollable. I also know that he is all that we need because he is waymaker, 
miracle worker, promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. He is our salvation, our hope. He is the hope of the world. There's really only one prayer to pray. Come, Spirit, come. I yield myself to you. I surrender myself to you. Katie, will you come and lead us in in this final song this morning?